Good Lord's Day evening, beloved. I trust you had a wonderful time worshiping our God today. I had a great time at church service this morning. Our pastor preached a powerful sermon and exhorted us to uh, vote and to vote biblically. So I feel a little bit more inspired to do what I'm about to do right now. But I will say that the algorithm and perhaps a number of Christians will not be too happy about what I'm about to say. But I already have a master and his name is Jesus. To him I stand or fall and he is able to make me stand. So here's a quick word as to why, Lord willing, I will be voting red this election. I understand what some are trying to convey when they claim that participating in a presidential election is voting for the lesser of two evils. I just don't agree with it for a couple of main reasons. One, we are not voting for evil. Voting for God's great institutions of marriage and family and human government and the sanctity of human life and things of that nature are not evil. It's only when you focus on the person, the candidate, that you can say that we are voting for evil, but we're not. We're voting for policies that align with God's will. The other reason is that mainstream media continues to practice the black art of trying to tell us how to think rather than just giving us the news. And they've gotten so addicted to wielding that ill-gotten power that only God will be able to rip it out of their subtle and scheming hands. So rather than give them precisely what they desire, which is to tell us how to think more about the political candidate than about their party's policies and legislations, let us consider a few things from a more biblical perspective. I've lost count of how many Christians I've heard tell me that they cannot vote for Donald Trump because they don't like him. To them, I said, I can't vote for Kamala Harris, even though I love her because Christ teaches us to love even our enemies. And I don't consider her my personal enemy. However, I can't vote for her for a very different reason than personal dislike. I cannot vote for her because of what she and her party's platform promotes, pushes, and legislates, namely the right to kill babies in the womb, the freedom to indoctrinate our kids into sexual perversions even without parental consent, the erasure of God's clear lines of distinction between male and female, and thus the direct attack on the one institution that his word declares is a representation of Christ and his church marriage. I've also lost count of how many Christians have fallaciously said to me that conservatives only care about life in the womb. To them I said, and have proven, that there is no more charitable group of people in all sorts of causes of giving, from adoption, fighting against drug and alcohol addiction, to combating human and child sex trafficking, ministering to the incarcerated, and even reaching out to help the children of those incarcerated, than conservative Christians. You see, when we learn to unplug from the mainstream media's wicked game, and when we pray to God for wisdom and do a little research of our own, we begin to discover that far too many of us are literally being told what to think by those who couldn't care less about what God thinks. And unfortunately, most of what we're being told is hardly ever the whole truth. It is instead the convenient truth that fits their agendas. Much of their philosophy seems to be, Get them to focus on the personalities and they'll be easier to control because they won't be focusing on the policies. And beloved, there are no policies as important as those that either promote or resist the perpetuation of things that God destroys nations for. Remember, scripture still says in Isaiah 5:20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Even though that verse was spoken by Isaiah on behalf of Yahweh directly to the people of Israel, it is a timeless principle that applies to all generations. You see, the God who created all things said it then and still means it even now. Woe not just to Israel, it says to those, meaning whoever calls evil good, whoever calls good evil. Woe to whoever puts darkness for light and whoever puts light for darkness. Woe to anyone who puts bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God is pronouncing a warning judgment on all who make that which is wrong seem right and who make that which is a lie seem true. And it is absolutely undeniable today that there is a party that is exerting massive amounts of energy, expending enormous amounts of money, and exhausting every available resource to do those sorts of Isaiah 520 things. For example, they claim that a baby is not a baby until they decide it's a baby. Yet even late into the third trimester of pregnancy, or even if it survives a botched abortion, it can be killed with impunity. They don't know what a woman is on one hand, and then they claim that they are fighting for women's rights when it comes to taking the life of that other body inside her body. Furthermore, they say they are for women's rights, 
but also pushed to make it possible for men to transition into women's sports and absolutely demoralize them. And they even allow transitioning men into women's prisons where they sexually assault women. They say a child should get to decide what gender it wants to be while attempting to deny the parents that brought them into this world the right to teach them the difference between male and female. They cry defund the police and then turn around and say we need more police when the crime waves they helped produce start negatively impacting their election campaigns. They unsecure the border to allow masses of people to pour into the country. They catch many in crimes and release the criminals with a promise to appear in court for a trial, which they never do. And many then go on to commit more crimes like taking over whole apartment complexes and even committing rapes and murders. If these things are not like Isaiah 520, I don't know what is. And then when the lawlessness begins to negatively impact their election or re-election chances, they switch and say, we need to secure the border. So not only is it Isaiah 520 in living color, but it also is nothing short of double-mindedness. And scripture reminds us that such is an indicator of instability in all one's ways. And for these reasons and others, it is crystal clear which party platform Christians should be voting for. The problem is that far too many who call themselves Christians have unresolved race issues in their hearts, and far too many others have not surrendered their lust for the things that other so-called privileged people have. So they allow themselves to be pandered to and even lied to over and over again with campaign promises made and broken. The great gain of godliness with contentment is virtually nowhere to be found among them when election time rolls around. I'm Kamala Harris and I approve this message. The faith community has always served as a beacon of hope in trying times. And this election is no different. We are going to remember this moment forever. The moment we chose joy and freedom as a new way forward. Some say faith and politics don't mix, but freedom and hope do. Seeing people from all different backgrounds races, religions, and genders gather to show their support and enthusiasm for Kamala, Kamala Harris, Harris is church. She exudes integrity, dignity, humanity, and empathy. And she can reach across the aisle, any aisle, and get things done. That's what we need in the White House. The time is now. The time is now. This moment, right now. Each of us are called to our own vineyard. This is Kamala's. When our sister wins, we, we all win. win. Vote for Kamala Harris by November the 5th. I'm Kamala Harris and I approve this message. And it is a sad and very telling commentary to see so many who claim to be children of the God of all creation, who is holy and righteous in all his ways, aiding and abetting such consistent anti-Christian incongruity and unhinged instability. When policies strike at the very core of the Imago Dei, against God's great institutions of marriage and family, against lawful human governance, and even the church and the body of Christ, they must be shunned by every Christian. We are not supposed to go and try to find fault with others to justify voting for that which directly defies God. And beloved, that is why before we vote, we must devote. We must devote ourselves to God and his word, the Holy Scriptures. As we do, we can count on the Holy Spirit's guidance in showing us just how starkly different the two major political parties currently are. And I hope that you realize that when Election Day is come and gone and whoever takes office is inaugurated, that your vote will still be actively either promoting or opposing the institutions God set up for a peaceful and productive society. And before you think about not voting, just imagine if every Christian in the country decided to do the same thing. Imagine what a vacuum would be created for evil to reign if we so hid our lights, if we so became such savorless salt. God established government. Passages like Romans 13, 1 to 7 and 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17 make that abundantly clear. And Christ sent us into all the world to influence all sectors of society, especially in the human institution that most directly impacts all of our daily lives in so many ways, government. So beloved, devote your vote to God by voting biblically. Not emotionally, not racially, not culturally, but biblically, beloved. God bless.